It is not easy to talk about qualitative data analysis in terms of a framework or guidelines, precisely because it's so flexible. This flexibility is also the reason why so many people have criticized qualitative data analysis or qualitative research in general, and also why so many people are concerned about doing qualitative data analysis, because some people may prefer uh, strict guidelines as in quantitative data analysis. So in quantitative data analysis it's uh, for some people a little bit easier because you have some statistical tests and measures which uh, simply if you know how to apply them you will get them right. In qualitative data analysis uh, the story is completely different. It's very flexible, it's very dynamic and it's very difficult to talk about specific universal guidelines. There are some steps however that can be applied almost universally for a qualitative data regardless of what study you are currently doing. As I'll explain at the end, there are also some types of studies that require completely different analysis techniques. But like I said, if we are to talk about general guidelines, here are some steps that usually can be applied to data analysis. What I usually argue and how I usually explain qualitative data analysis is that in the initial uh, stage when you have obviously transcribed your data and you have it on your computer uh, or in your notes if you're not using software, the first stage involves familiarizing yourself with the data. So it involves exploration and reading through your data to uh, get a feel of what's happening there. So you want to read through your data carefully through all your interview transcripts because in this video we're, we're talking about interviews and ideally start making notes. Uh, make notes of what you observe, what you see, whether you see any trends or patterns. These don't have to be very detailed notes. This is not the actual uh, in-depth analysis yet. It's just, as I said, to generate a general feeling of what's happening. So if you see any trends, if you see anything interesting, anything surprising perhaps, make a note. Also what I like to stress is that uh, it's quite useful to make more detailed notes in which you reflect on your initial impressions and also on what to, uh, you expect to find. Sometimes uh, when you read through your interview transcript or when you read uh, through several transcripts you begin to suspect that something may be the case. So when you think about your research questions you begin to form this initial uh, work in hypothesis. Uh, it doesn't have to be supported uh, with any evidence. This is important, this is what I always stress. That uh, you may have these work in hypothesis about what's happening or a work in uh, initial model of uh, a given phenomenon or experience that you're investigating. This model or hypothesis doesn't have to be supported by evidence. It can be just your initial reflection but still it's uh, just as important to make a note of it so it doesn't mean that uh, because you don't have much data to provide evidence for that uh, model uh, it doesn't mean that you don't need to write it down. Why is it important to write it down? Because uh, these notes and these initial ideas and these initial work in hypothesis will drive your data analysis. Uh, this is what happens. So you're trying to either dismiss or support this hypothesis or this uh, suspicion or uh, what you expect will happen in the data and while you're doing that you're investigating that data further. Also at later stages you will come back to these uh, notes and see uh, how right or how wrong you were at this initial stage. So to summarize in this first stage you're reading your data, you're making notes both of what you're seeing in the data and also what you're suspecting. At this stage you're inevitably uh, getting ready to code your data. Inevitably because you're looking at the data, you're increasingly recognizing, uh, as I said, patterns and trends. And this is what happens when you code the data. So when you code the data, for those of you uh, who don't know what it's all about, you're just labeling pieces of text, uh, so certain segments of the text with uh, certain uh, names or themes. So 
it's really a common sense practice. It may sound like something very scientific or technical, but it's really not. So it's almost natural. When you're reading your text and you're seeing certain topics, you just want to mark that piece of text or label that piece of text so that later you know what it's all about when, when you have labeled many, many extracts in several interviews. And this is what coding is about. It's about classifying your data, segregating your data, so that you can later quickly uh, gain access to uh, specific extracts that you want to gain access to. I won't have time to talk in detail about coding in this video, but I uh, do discuss coding and all the other stages that I cover in this, in this video in my self-study course on uh, how to analyze qualitative data. I'll put the link in the description below the video. But basically what happens with the codes is that they also gradually uh, tend to be merged and become more and more, more and more abstract. So first you have a lot of codes, you're labeling all these different extracts, but gradually you begin to merge these codes, so link these codes, put them together into certain groups or categories. Uh, you begin to develop certain uh, hierarchies, uh, so uh, some subcodes or subcategories. So when you have, for example, a code called emotions, you want to put some subcodes under it, so uh, codes describing different emotions. So again, you're just classifying your data, you're putting these labels so it's easier to organize the data and easier to find specific extracts that you, you want to find in your data. You usually continue with this coding uh, throughout uh, all your interview extracts or all your uh, sources of data if you're not analyzing interviews. So you're coding all these extracts and then again all the time the coding framework develops and evolves. So sometimes you find a new, uh, an example of some new phenomenon in uh, another interview extract that you're reading through and then you introduce a new code. Sometimes you go back to the previous extracts, you're comparing the codes or looking for this uh, evidence of this new code or new phenomenon in the previous extracts that you read. So basically this is uh, the central part that many of us associate data analysis with. So the coding, going through all the interview transcripts and coding these transcripts. Remember that even at this stage you're still making notes, you're still exploring the data, you're still reflecting on what's happening, so you're constantly writing down your ideas, you're constantly investigating certain uh, leads and you're constantly reflecting on a general model. So when you think back to your research questions, you're thinking how is uh, what you're finding here, what you're seeing here, how is it related to your research questions? Does it answer your research questions? Contrary to a common opinion, common view, coding is not the final product of data analysis. It's just a step in data analysis. As I said, it's a very important, it's a central step which helps you organize your data so that you can actually explore it in more depth and analyze it. So usually when I have my data coded, and again, uh, remember that it's not, uh, a, there is no a single point where, when this happens, uh, not a single point when I say, okay, the data is coded, it's finished. Because coding continues throughout the whole data. I quite often delete or add codes even at the very final stages. But there is a stage when you have this more or less uh, clearly developed coding framework. At that stage, because it's, uh, my data set is organized so well, I can start doing uh, what I call within case analysis. So I'm looking at each extract and this is when I'm really thinking about my research questions and uh, looking for evidence or something that will help me answer these research questions. And quite often at this stage I'm also investigating all these ideas, all my initial hypothesis. I'm also trying to put all of this together and try to develop another model that would explain what's happening there. A model that would include all the codes that I have. So these codes that are gradually becoming more and more abstract, uh, more and more uh, higher in this abstract hierarchy, so they are not just describing literally what's in the data, but sometimes they describe some more inclusive and, and more abstract concepts. I'm trying to fit all these codes into this one model, into this one framework, and uh, again hypothesize and theorize about the possible relationships between these different elements of that model. 
and as I said at the beginning, uh, since these are just uh, my suspicions, just theories, I'm trying to find evidence either for or against these uh, hypothetical relationships. And this is how my analysis develops. So I'm looking for evidence, I'm uh, beginning to analyze what the participants said in more depth. There are many, many things that can be done at this stage. Uh, I wrote about these things, these different ideas and steps for what to analyze in my blog article and also again I talk in much more depth about it in my self-study course that I put the link in the description. But some things involve looking at the language they use, for example looking at repetitions or whether uh, the participants contradict themselves. I'm looking at emotions that certain uh, accounts evoke, so I l I'm looking at uh, how my participants react to certain questions, what uh, language they use, whether they use emotionally marked language when they, uh, when they talk about particular experiences. And also I look at what topics the participants choose to talk about, as well as what topics go together. So when they talk about one topic uh, and they start immediately start uh, talking about another topic, to me, quite often this is an indication that this other topic is important or uh, that uh, in my participants' mind these two topics are related. So I do all these things that uh, can be labeled as within case comparison or within case analysis and then I move on and I start doing what is called cross case comparisons or cross case analysis. So in this case I'm, com uh, I'm comparing uh, what I found in each interview transcript. So I'm not, uh, so at this next stage I'm not just looking at individual participants, I'm looking at similarities and differences between different transcripts, between different participant accounts. And as I compare these different cases, uh, the whole goal is obviously uh, developing towards uh, a unifying theory or explanation of what's happening, a theory or explanation that would answer my research questions. So this is basically this very rough outline of what happens in qualitative data analysis. First you read through your transcripts, you record your initial observations, then you code the data, so you just organize that data, then you start looking at the codes, you, using the codes you created, you start looking uh, at the data in more detail and theorizing about what's happening, then you start analyzing the data, so applying all these different procedures uh, to your data to really gain an in-depth view of what's in there and then you start comparing your cases to kind of uh, try to come up with a unifying explanation that characterizes most of your uh, data. As I said, qualitative data analysis is extremely flexible, extremely dynamic, uh, so every data set is unique and it's uh, very difficult to talk about a set of common universal rules or guidelines. So bear in mind that what I covered in this video I find it useful in most cases but it doesn't mean that it can be applied to any kind of uh, data set or any kind of study. So you have these specific studies that uh, have their own guidelines, their own procedures for data analysis. So for example if you're doing conversation analysis where uh, the stress is on the language, on the structural aspects of the language, on the form, so not just on the content but on the form, uh, you are applying a different set of procedures, not just during the analysis but even during the transcription, so the way you transcribe the data is already different. If you're doing a narrative analysis where uh, the focus is both on form and content, so again you're interested in the content but also in how the participants express these meanings, again your analysis will focus on slightly different things. But most importantly, because qualitative data analysis is so flexible, it is important that you pay attention, you are responsive to your data. So you know your research questions and you know your data set and nobody knows uh, that better than you. So it's important that you keep your research questions in mind, You're, you look at your data and you just apply anything that works that helps you understand that data. So you may be interested in the content, so in general content of what they tell you, but it doesn't mean that you can't be uh, interested or you can't analyze the form as well. And I do it quite a lot to strengthen my argument. So for example, again, if I was investigating uh, migrants' experiences, 
I would be mainly interested in the content, but I would, I would also look at the language they use. So whether it was emotionally marked and how they express meanings, uh, what kind of language they used when they uh, recollected certain experiences. So this means uh, you can apply a little bit of everything when you're analyzing your data and you will not be criticized for that. So again, as I said, there is no right or wrong way to do it. So just remember that you need to be extremely flexible and remember uh, think about your research questions and just do whatever it takes to analyze your data and to answer these research questions.